It's the crypto hunter, John Rhodes, with us tonight as we talk about the reptilian humanoid theory. And we'll be back with more on Coast to Coast AM. John, we were talking about the eyes of these reptilians and what they might mean uh, behind the eyes of human beings. What do you think? The eyes of reptilians behind the eyes of human beings. I think that um, uh, I've heard reports where people have had encounters where one became angry or threatened by another person, where they said that they could see their eyes change and shift into like a vertical slit pupil. Now, I know that there is something called eidetic memory, and eidetic memory is a form of a visual overlay, no different than like birds when they see geomagnetic lines on the, on the Earth. The Earth, now they've proven that they actually have a visual overlay where they can see geomagnetic lines, and this is how some of them are, are, are navigating. And I think the same thing exists over the eyes of a child and, and over our eyes, and it's not a physical um, layer or anything like that over your eye. It's a, a way that your imagination interfaces with your visual system and that when you actually have an encounter and you feel struck to the heart and you can see that a person is not is demonstrating an aspect of themselves, which I call the Draco within everybody, um, then there's this kind of a visual overlay that makes you see that they are being the dragon that they are being. And um, it's a very subjective thing that happens to very sensitive people. We've seen this thing on, on, on the YouTube where they say that the reporter's eyes are, are, are look like vertical slit pupils, and that's mm-hmm. just not the way that is. That's been shown that it's just the way that the lights in front of the person speaking, the white lights on each side of, their, of the speaker are actually squeezing out the iris and making it blend into the white of their eye and making it squeeze out the black where you can't see it. That makes it look vertical. So this is something that's just been overstated, you know, and kind of it's been driving the whole reptilian humanoid thing into the land of ridicule to hear people go over and over again about some report that looks like the reptilian humanoid. And the same thing about the pixelation when people see that on YouTube where the the pixelation rate is changing and and it looks like their face is shape-shifting. I've seen people you know, they even make the di- most damning charges against reptilian humanoids on, on, on YouTube actually do the same thing. And I'm not, that can't, can't mean that everybody is a reptilian humanoid. So I think that um, we're, we're sensing something within ourselves, and then there are the, going to be the cases where we're dealing with something that's not entirely human. It's just very, very difficult to actually determine how that might be. It's not like they all, you know, everybody's, this reptilian humanoid is out there, you know, telling everybody who they are. John, tell us a little bit about some of the reports that have come into you over the years that got you to investigate this. And are they are they evolving themselves? Are they changing? Yeah. Um, in the very first, the reports were from um, from very good people. Some of them were just, you know, they were what you'd call even pillars in, in society. These are individuals that came forward saying that they had seen something. It was highly anomalous. They were embarrassed by seeing it. They didn't. Know, they couldn't deny it, and it was bugging them. And they really would prefer not to have seen it at all. It was disruptive to their life, and it found they found it hard to focus in their normal life after that. Some of these after effects, you know, were so pronounced and and of such a negative way that it's not like somebody would be making up stories like that. And then putting themselves through such heartbreaking transformation, a, a psychological a, a self-destruction almost, because your whole, their whole reality had come apart. So I started hearing these reports, and then, you know, there were cases like um, in 1988 in Bishopville, South Carolina, after, you know, 18-year-old Bishop, uh, Christopher Davis had his sighting, and then the whole town erupted into kind of a circus. Everybody was coming there with dogs and shotguns. They wanted to go no. into the swamp and hunt this yeah. thing down. It was, it was. People do that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do it, man. That's why people say, you know, John, would you actually direct people to if you've located a cave full of reptoids? And it's like, I, I'm, I don't think I would really, to tell you the truth, because I, I had a marine call me a couple months ago <laughs> on one of my open lines. He said, George, we're going out and we're going to shoot Bigfoot. And I went, No, you're not. And I had to <laughs> yeah. talk him out of it. You know, you know, and then can you blame these other species for really trying to stay away from us, you know? And um, uh, when you start hearing reports like this, one of them actually came from a full bird colonel. You know, he was describing a, a half-man, half-dinosaur to Sheriff Liston Truesdale out there. And, 
you know, Liston's an FBI trained sheriff. This isn't a guy that, you know, takes reports lightly. He knows how to determine if somebody's telling the truth. And then they, there's all this mix-up with people saying, well, it's really Bigfoot down in South Carolina, when I don't think that a lieutenant colonel is going to make a, 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 a misinterpretation between a dinosaur man and something like a hairy Bigfoot. There's, it's quite a big difference. In addition to that, most of those sightings, the, the beings have three fingers, not four, you know, like a, a mammal, a typical mammal would have. So you, you, I started hearing all these reports, and then I started experiencing resistance in the UFO community to even want to hear any of this. It Why? Was like, well, I think it's because everybody, you know, it became kind of, and I hate to say this, in a, in a way they became resistant to change. They figured that they just got introduced to the to the little greys, and now we're just not being threatened by them anymore, and it's difficult for everybody, everybody to shift around and look in a different direction. In addition to that, yeah. I, I think there was a perception by saying that they were terrestrially evolved was trying to say that they they didn't their their points of view were invalid when actually like again i believe, believe that there was a group that may, uh, uh, evolved here w was open on the earth side by side with human beings at one time who went back underground and a large part of them left you know their military industrial elite left to explore space but these guys are coming back and this is their planet you know it, and it's interesting to think if if we're going to if we're going to ever be in, encountering some sort of a, 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 an encounter in the future, some sort of an open contact uh, uh, in, in our lifetimes, that um, if something came here to say that this is, this is their terrestrial origins, then, you know, it doesn't mean we can't live together. Well, you know? uh, if, if, if they're friendly, why are so many people, at least the image of a reptilian, why does it appear to be very, very dangerous? Um, there's several reasons for it. The first one is that um, because we are evolved mammals, um, for millions of years, I think that our, our ancestors were scrambling under the feet of hung hungry reptiles, and we were their food. And after enough, you know, uh, the stresses of our environment gave us inherited fears, just like when an animal goes out. They, you know, they, in nature, they know that some plants are poisonous. They don't have to eat them to die to find out. They just know they're poisonous. How do they know? How do they know that there are certain other creatures that are inherently dangerous to it? I think that there's a, a form of inherent intelligence we have that comes across as instinct or some sort of an internal knowledge that we inherit through our ancestors, and that um, this is the main reason why human beings are predisposed to being afraid of reptiles. They've done studies of this and actually found that school children that haven't met a lot of animals before, there will be more of them afraid of reptiles than there were of other mammal creatures. There's something inherent within human psychology. The other thing, too, is this religious indoctrination we've been going through for, you know, now 2,000 years and such, where really... The, before the transition to the to the cult of the uh, of the eagle or mars based warrior man 's domination over our spirituality in the form of the Roman Catholic Church, um, this world was dominated predom was predominantly snake worshiping serpent worshiping cults and that 's from all lands of all nations and all corners of the globe and that was an image that more or less helped people get along because they unified in their in their single vision of something that was inherently spiritual in them so no matter even if they looked different they had something in common but when that shifted over to this this eagle based warrior cult mars man uh a male dominated system that we live in now um that uh, that kind of squeezed that out, and and for two thousand years we've been told to be afraid of these reptilian humanoids or any forms of them by not only the church, but we find ourselves even nowadays being told to be afraid of them by mainstream um, conspiracy uh, uh, authors and and UFO people, and and some of these cases are are correct. You should have uh, due vigilance and fear of them, but not necessarily as much as might be currently being promoted. And then there's the media, how they project it through the years. You and I have been watching these programs, you know, from the claymation dinosaurs all the way up through, you know, the the um, the, uh, the earliest times when in, 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 in we used to see the, the the lizard man hiss, and we saw all these pro projections of the media where usually anything associated with the snake is painted in negative light. True. But you know, the snake, for example, is part of the logo for medicine, isn't it? Absolutely it is. So what we're actually looking at there is some sort of a vestigial 
um, uh, sim- symbolism from ancient times in which really the, the snake was a very benevolent uh, transformational character, and it is also within human thinking. But as long as we've been conditioned to be afraid of it, there's really an aspect of our deepest psychology that's connected with the reptilian brain that really we're throwing out of balance. We're acting as if it's a part of our, it's not a part of ourselves and that it's foreign and something to be afraid of and that it's stronger than us, and that's just not the case. It's a, it's a part of us. That's one of the things I've, I've always wondered is that um, there's something ma- magical about being human in as much as, yeah, we have, a, 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 we have these emotions, but these emotions can drive a powerhouse in our heart that can help us manifest things that other maybe aliens can't do. I've always wondered if not only angels, but aliens themselves, even the reptilians are, are worried about the full humans reaching their full potential because they may need devices like, you know, transporters or whatever, like Star Trek, you know, machines to make things. But I think human beings, at some point in time, we will be able to manifest things out of thin air. And we've done it before. And I believe that these other more ancient beings than in us, that we are really a piece of all of them. If we, if we think that we were created by some parts of them, then we are the best aspects of them. And we might be one day able to do magical things. And that would threaten them. Do you remember the movie Enemy Mine with Dennis Quaid and yes, Louis yeah. Gossett Jr.? Now, that was one of the few movies that ever depicted a reptilian in a good light. Remember that? Absolutely, it did. And actually, it, the main message of the film is that we are more alike than we are different. Remember, it, you know, our leadership and people that keep secrets from us, that manipulate us, they, get, they really benefit for, by us being in fear and having enemies. And, and, you know, when you have the primary forces on this earth actually generating money from uh, making and manufacturing weapons of war, then really peace and the lack of fear doesn't benefit them. It benefits us. So when somebody tries to push us into a fearful state, we have to really wonder who it's benefiting and also who's really a threat. I mean, really, are, is it the average man that's at threat or if something's going to be coming back here that's offering a new chance for us? Is it a threat to the existing structure of authority here? And, that, and is that authority convincing us to defend it when really it's time for new management? It's just a very difficult political situation that we, I believe that we're going to encounter in the situation in the future. It's not going to be easy. Now, John, are you saying the reptilians were always here or they came here and stayed? I believe personally that um, there, I, there's a high potential for the the – the dinosaurs um, from the 65 million years ago, some of them to have actually retreated underground and have um, inhabited the underworld. You know, there's a lot of fresh water down there. There's actually a lot of air, fresh air that runs through cavern systems sure. and such. absolutely. And that um, some of these dinosaurs, specifically down in Antarctica, that were pre, um, preconditioned to be living in a dark environment for long periods of time, when, when this devastation occurred, they were pre-adapted to cold environments, and the cold that may have otherwise forced a lot of you know, lineages of dinosaurs to die off, these would have been the last ones, perhaps, to live. And I think that um, some of the exotic plants and stuff that they were eating, they may have gone back into caves and cavern systems and uh, eventually started um, eating some of the plant growth that came out of their own fecal matter. And some of that stuff may have actually been of the mushroom form. And this may have actually stimulated self-consciousness at first and maybe gave them the intuitive, quote-unquote, knowledge through out-of-body experiences, even of their own, to know where to go deeper and deeper underground for shelter and protection to where they might, uh, might one day you know, be able to uh, survive and, and reproduce it, um, to form their own small population groups. And if, and if we could have come as far as we did in two million years... Even 3 million years, give us 5 million years. We're talking about 65 million years ago. These things evolved into birds, and some of these birds that can even talk, they can sing, they can dance to the beat of music. <laughs> I mean, these are evolved dinosaurs. You know, so how many other huh. creatures on Earth have actually demonstrated that kind of ability? We're talking about the potential for nature itself to show something so beautiful and so magnificent and, and intelligent. And I think that we're just on the border of really recognizing what this world is filled with. And I'm going to I'm going to save the devil for you when we come back. We'll talk, <laughs> we're going to talk about that. But I want to get your reaction to ABC's show V and what you think that tie-in could be with reptilian humanoids. Uh, 
Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I just um, I just got up actually last uh, this last weekend. I came back from uh, me getting a, a private screening at the uh, at the home of Jace Hall. He's uh, he's the executive producer of V, and um, got a private screening of the, of the premiere of it. And uh, I was joined also by Logan Huffman. He's the uh, young gentleman, the actor that plays Kyle in the series. And um, uh, Jace, he's more or less the imaginative engine that's running the the project. He and Scott Peters uh, have put it together, and, and they're putting it out. Um, uh, he has also the Jace Hall show and doing things on the internet, and, and you you can um, you know Google him or whatever. Yeah. But um, he he wanted to, he invited me over, and we locked, watched the premiere. And there's a couple things he wanted to say. First and foremost was that um, he told me that. It, to let you guys know that he was well aware of my research uh, before formulating the ideas for the show for V, Good. and that um, he's been sensitive to the issues that have been brought up in the UFO community in regards to how they're actually presenting this on a- ABC. So this isn't just some kid out of college who hasn't had his fingers on the pulse of the American public when it comes to the subject matter. And uh, having a gaming background, he's b- really bringing a new vision of... of, of um, what it is to be to have the experience and and the entertainment of something that would otherwise be fearful to people and um uh i get the feeling that uh the show in itself has a a lot of potential and it's it's really riveting people when you watch it on it's going to be tomorrow night uh it's really critical that this show starts making it it's some people would charge that it's some sort of a new world order thing or anything like that and it's what is just a revivement of some series that we saw back in the 1980s and um you know he, i think that it has the potential of helping desensitize us to the reptilian humanoid character and also to wake humanity up to the to the importance of the, it no matter what comes from outer space when something arrives to say that it's a savior uh, whether it's a gray, whether it's a reptoid, whether it's a, a, a you know a Mars-based man giant or something like that, that we have to be careful not to fall into sudden worship or or to feel that the the saviors have arrived because regardless of what we look like, you know we still many of us share similar characteristics and deceit is one of them. Uh, so, absolutely, and the and the the premise of this show, of course, is the extraterrestrial race comes to Earth with good intentions, seemingly only to slowly reveal their true machinations, and then they try to ingrain themselves into society. So they trick us, though, don't they? Right. Well, it's a trick, but also what it is is it really is a deeper exploration of human consciousness and how we can um, experience leadership and be lured by it. And, and it has, there's a lot of social statements that are made in the programming as well, so they're bringing a lot of fresh things out. And, um, yeah, it is a matter of... A deceptive means, but you know, even uh, even God in the Bible uses deceptive means to get the jobs done. Sometimes, and and so it's not enter- entirely wrong. Um, sometimes you coming out, you know, by revealing your true intentions at first may not be the thing to do. This program um, really is an exploration of all the things that we've been talking about for twenty years on coast to coast. You know, Jace is a fan of yours. Yes, Logan's a fan of yours. I, I, I know. T- T- Tommy's, Tommy's working with getting him on the show as, as guests. Absolutely. Logan's excited about it. He wants to be able to come out. These are the guys that are playing the parts and writing down, and, and they're truly doing their best to try and absorb all our concerns and play it out in a format which will be entertaining, but at the same time thought-provoking. And let's talk about that when we come back, John. Thought-provoking. Do they know something that most people don't? Are we trying to be desensitized? And then again, why does this thing look like the devil? We'll be back in a moment with John Rhodes, the Crypto Hunter, on Coast to Coast AM. Well, next hour, we'll take your phone calls with the Crypto Hunter, John Rhodes, followed by full moon open lines during the final hour of Coast to Coast AM. We'll be right back. Don't touch your dial. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. We've got John Rhodes with us, the Crypto Hunter. I like that title, by the way, John. It fits you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, now the devil. The devil looks like a reptilian. <laughs> he does, George. So the question is, what came first, the devil and people called him a reptilian? Mm. Or did the reptilians come here and maybe people thought they were the devil? What do you think? 
Well, I, I think that perhaps, um, and I've heard this said by a pagan once, somebody that was definitely pagan, they said that if, they, if there was no devil before, after Christianity appeared, there certainly was. In other words, the thought consciousness itself may have actually manifested something really, really negative and evil. Um, you know, in that book that we read, the, 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 that we hold so close to our heart, for many of us, the Bible, it mm -hmm. does actually talk about a reptilian in the Garden of Eden, um, and that uh, uh, this reptilian bestowed um, intelligence upon people, and that in the, in the original Garden, we weren't supposed to be intelligent. We were supposed to be... We were supposed to be slaves. We were supposed to be gardeners. We were supposed to tend the fields. But something came along and said that you're much more worthy of being more godlike than you are just slaves. And for that, kind of woke humanity up. That's the old story. And for that, that reptilian or that, <clears throat> I would call it perhaps a Draco, because the the oldest texts of the Jewish texts actually speak of it having wings and having the two legs of a man and the two arms of a man and being as tall as a camel. Uh, this kind of fits right along what we would classify classif classically call a, d a devil looking like being. Mm -hmm. Horns, um, wings, reptilian skin, and, um, and you know, the, the whole horn issue is another thing, too, because even in the ancient drawings of Moses coming down the mountain, after he saw God, they draw him with, depicted with horns. The earliest angels were depicted with horns. So um, <clears throat> we're actually talking about this being, uh, which was in the garden of being able to help humans out, and, and for that was cast underground. And since that time, it's always been projected as an image of something that was negative and evil, when actually it was trying to make us something more than what we were designed to be. Um, there's a lot of people that believe that, uh, you know, that these things, these devils, as you might call them, they, they have enemies. And this is where we might be coming up to some sort of an event in the future of some sort of conflict. But um, definitely you're talking about something coming from underground because the, the reptilian humanoid uh, image is synonymous with the underworld. And that when you start looking at the area of which we is long associated with death and mystery and talking about something coming from the other side. And the, hell. And, and hell. hell, absolutely, you know, not a good place. Um, that this invokes a lot of fear in everybody, so they usually are associated in these two these beings with fear. Remember, in that in that in the Bible, there was a God turns around after Adam and Eve were woken up, and He turns around at the serpent and Eve, and He says that He's going to create an enmity between the serpent and Eve, and their, and both their and their offsprings. In other words, somebody came along and said, "I'm going to make sure that you guys are think of each other as enemies, so you don't get along anymore. I don't want to have this kind of interaction." And we were separated as species groups. But then the hierarchy from both groups have, have really surreptitiously undermined the, the, their, their civilizations on all sides. I think that even the reptoids underground probably have a hierarchy that they don't agree with. And these guys might be elitist military types just like we have ours. Is it and, possible, John, that fallen angels were reptilians? <clears throat> well, you know, it... it yeah, I think that there's a potential that what we call the sons of serpents descended upon earth and instructed humankind, that the reptilian image is actually something that has, has been very, very ancient. And even though human beings on the surface of the earth may have undergone several civilizations before, that these guys drop in on occasion to watch what's going on and to participate in the show, because we're living in a big show. I mean, most of everything we perceive as real is nothing but other than what the press is telling us and what people are conformed to believe. You, you've been making history for the last, you know, 10, 20 years, sitting here announcing every night that the world is not as it seems. And you know what? You must be saying something right because there's a lot of people out there that agree. Yeah. So we, we all acknowledge that the world isn't as it seems, but some people just don't want to be woken up. If I hear you right, John, you sound like the reptilians are probably getting the bad end of the stick here, the short end. <clears throat> well, I can't say it's undeserved. They they have at times been, you know, the bad boys on the block, just like we have, just like, you know, some like Yahweh says, go down into that valley and kill every man, woman, and child. I mean, you know, there's they everybody has this potential to have really bad things and bad qualities. 
And I think that um, because of religious indoctrination, and hopefully um, I'm wrong, um, because of the potential of something reptilian humanoid coming back here on Earth and using that as an excuse, as a threat, to try and unify all the forces on Earth into one global movement and, and to point an accusing finger at some craft that may have been remotely piloted and, and had part of an attack or something and pull out a reptilian humanoid. After television shows and after 2,000 years of indoctrination, it would be really easy for us to, to be tricked into believing that something that's coming here to help us is actually something that's coming here to remove uh, the power elite and try and give the earth a breath, a breath of fresh air. And we've got to be vigilant of that. In other words, uh, we can't, I think we've been through enough history, including Pearl Harbor, to recognize afterwards that sometimes we're manipulated into positions in which later on we find out that it may not have been the right move. I think everybody in their heart knows what's going on. And if you see something in front of you that's happening to where you see innocence or the helpless, being defensively killed or hurt, step in and put your life on the line. But that goes for something that may not even be human that's defensive and helpless. Step in and protect that, just as you would hope they would step in and protect you. Now let's go back, though, to the beginning of the show where we talked about men in black working to protect and maintain secrecy of reptilian humanoids. Mm -hmm. Why the partnership? If there is a <clears throat> well, you know, we have to wonder why the partner. Why haven't all these other alien groups come down and made contact with us? We've had the the tall Nordic blondes. We've had the insectoids. We've had the 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 praying mantis type. We've had the long nosed grays. We have all kinds of beings that are we know that are interacting with us. But uh, there must be some sort of controlling force. Look, you know. Um, I had a friend a number of years ago that developed a solar tracker that was accurate to some, a certain degree of the sun, which is much more than anybody else had developed. They had problems getting it patented, and finally they actually received notes saying that you, they had to sign an affidavit saying that they didn't work for any military intelligence groups or anything like that, and that this wasn't proprietary information, that they were just trying to privatize. And then they ended up receiving something that quoted some law saying that if, if they find that there's a technology that's available that's trying to be patented that could be damaging to the U.S. economy, put millions of people out of work overnight or something like that, that they have a right at a national security to sequester that pet technology and pay you for it over a prolonged period of time, but like 20, 30 years to where you're not allowed to talk about it, and that's all part of the agreement. Huh. And so... You can understand if you suddenly came up with something that would put millions of people out of work, is it really the right thing to do? And they have to have these checks and balances figuring out, you know, what's worth bringing out. And there are roundtable groups that do back engineer technologies. You know, I have personal friends and, and they're, you know, that they've got other family members that have talked about, you know, being involved in, you know, projects that have gone underground and, and actually been Somebody I knew that saw back in the 1960s, uh, HD 3D television in a box in an underground base in the 1960s. <laughs> so if that's the case, then can you see how we all this progression is being doled out to us at very, very calculated lengths of time to where they can t give us the least amount of tech technological advancement and then suck us for dry of everything we have? Well, we know one of the reasons we don't have so-called free energy or zero-point energy is because uh, of the money and uh, possibly what you just said, the effect on people's jobs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a uh, – the, how many millions of people must work in all kinds of utilities? Right. You have to take all that into consideration. Um, it's just as much as when they – came up with these um, tube shuttle systems in the 1970s that were connecting all these underground bases. You know, look, we, it would be really smart for us to take all of our infrastructure, even just even if we put up tube shuttle routes, routes not to take passengers, but just to take cargo back and forth to the United States. It would cut down on pollution. It would make so many smart, do so many things that would be good for us, including increasing national security. And ensuring that we have a transportation system that can sustain a meteorite impact if we had one dead center of the U.S. or something. But, um, uh, but the, the fact is, is that this, this kind of technology is being withheld from us, and it's being used by the elitists on the reptilian side as well as the human side to just empower that 3% that own everything. And that just doesn't seem right. They say that about America and the rest of the world. They go, well, you Americans, look, you eat up all our resources and this, that, and the other, but you only re represent like 15% of, or whatever, 7% of global population. I don't know the figure. I'm just making this up as I'm saying it. But, but as a point, 
we're a smaller percentage that eats what and takes advantage of the resources of most of the world. But even in our own society, we have a top 3% that takes most of what we earn. But it's time, it's time that that sh shifts around a little bit. Look, if we can take over GM and not admit that we're going socialist in a, in a way in this country, then maybe some things need to be, maybe some need, things need to be socialized and other things need to be like left alone to be privatized. There's no reason why the two structures can't seem to coincide together. It's the old thinking of our fathers, these guys that almost wrecked the world before us that kept thinking in such contrasting means to where that's not possible. You know, true socialism doesn't work in Russia, but as we can see, this isn't working over here. Is there going to come a time where there will be direct interaction between humans and these humanoids? Well, I, be I believe there have, has been. Um, uh, I mean, on a mass scale. On a mass most scale. Of us, Look yeah. at Fatima, though. Fatima saw the craft come down, 72,000 people. I mean... Um, no, John, we all know the sun came down. Don't yeah, we? we all know the sun came down. <laughs> That's right. We all know that somebody threw a Frisbee. You know, um, uh, a big one. Yeah, a big one. Uh, I, I, I believe that we are, if, if, if at all possible, even if the ETs are here and they're listening to us, even if they were over Mexico City in 1991 trying to point out something to do with the sun, obviously it's all solar generated. If you get these be beings looking at timeline cycles and, and prophecies and symbolism all coming to a merging point um, in 2011, 2012, out of two, three hundred years either way, there doesn't seem to be a more, a more perfectly aligned symbolic alignment that we're going through, that these guys wouldn't in some way initiate that as a part of their own ritual. Some people believe it's... it's um, after we go through a measured point of devastation that we're going to come out the other side, the survivor is going to come out the other side and have a little help to pull their britches up and to put, put ourselves together after witnessing perhaps the largest depopulation on the surface of the earth due to environmental and other causes. John, of, of all this work that you've been doing over the years, do you finally feel as if you're getting close to a finish here? I, I, I'm feeling like there's the greatest opportunity for some sort of a breakthrough. Um, I'm hoping that enough of us can carry enough thought form energy to where we can really just kind of pop the bubble um, and, and, you know, call out, for, call out for help. Obviously, we can't change the system, and, and maybe we need to all have to turn around and at the same time, you know, just like in the movie network, stand up and say, I'm sick and tired of it and I'm not going to take any more. And say, listen, we, we've been trying to get our leadership to, to be able to provide us a vision of the future, which isn't so dismal, that gives us hope that maybe something isn't so corrupt, and, but we need some sort of a breakthrough. Maybe if we call out to the universe for that breakthrough, we can somehow have one of these forces, or at least the leadership that isn't part of some sort of federation group, finally say, well, they've asked, and the time is now, and the time is right. I can only pray that that happens. You know, it would be terrible to meet your end on the way out of your your body, you're turning around and saying, man, I just didn't quite get to that point and have it happen the next day, you know? Who would be against the reptoids? I'm sorry? Who would be against the reptoids? I mean, do they have uh, their own enemies out there? Yeah, okay, let's, let's see if I can kind of like surmise this real quick. Um, I pointed out recently that... Um, uh, if you if you look at ancient civilization here on Earth, you'll find out that um, that it appears as though uh, this was originally a, a, a planet that was a reptilian humanoid, reptilian dominated, and that we mammal man were around, but these other guys were still dominating the planet, and that something happened um, to uh, Mars and the other planet that ended up being the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter and that the surface of Mars was blown off, maybe some sort of a solar event or some sort of a galactic event took place to where the atmosphere of Mars was blown off and only the, the military industrial elite on the Mar under the Martian surface actually came down to Earth as survivors. And that um, when they did, uh, these guys were, are, brought with them the eagle as a symbol and they were white Anglo-Saxon um, large titan uh, giant men and women and these are the valkyries these are the giants of ancient times that we talk about and that um, originally they took some of the beings that were here and uh, genetically modified them to, so they could have other 
somebody help take care of the, the planet, and that was supposed to be us. Um, however, some fifth column group around here that kind of watched off to the sides and saw what was going on said this is kind of wrong to let this, these beings with such great potential go without some help here. And this is where the Garden of Eden comes along. They, they, maybe the crab apple or some other, some sort of a, psycho, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 um, psy, a psychoactive uh, uh, substance was given to us and suddenly somehow modified human thinking and even the generations after that. And, and these, these guys, these Mars-based men are very warrior cult-like. They believe in doing it their way. They are military-industrial complex all the way down to where we have today. And also the reptilian humanoids who were serpent symbolized um, also were this kind of opposing group that always, between the two of them, there was like this balance of power taking part on this planet. And that both groups we've interacted with, some of them we call them angels, and the others we call demons or devils and such and depending on who you're running into they're demons or they're uh, you know they're fallen angels or they're benevolent beings looking in different life forms but i believe that there's some sort of a potential for conflict that's going to be coming back another mahabharata one of these great wars in heaven in which the two sides are fighting uh, my suspicion is is that they're really fighting over us as resources our souls and our commitment and that um Maybe. Good, is it good against bad up there? Well, it, it's and it's not species against species, but really what we're looking at is we're looking at peop, human beings that are trying to get out of the crushing hill of the oppressors that govern over them, and the same within the other species groups. They've had these elitists on, on all species groups that have been dominating everybody, and we're waiting for somehow that balance of power to s slip over, and hopefully that, that time is coming up soon. Sooner than later, John. I hope. Well, yeah, sooner than later. I mean, you are broadcasting from somewhere deep underground, aren't you, George? Absolutely. They can't find me. <laughs> <laughs> they can knock out my satellite, but they can't find me. That's right. Well, wherever we have an FM radio, George, you're our voice. Keep 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 up the resistance. <laughs> and AM as well. Wherever. Absolutely. So, what's new for you? What uh, What are you doing next with your projects? Uh, well, my next projects are um, doing work on the website. I'm updating the website and getting ready to um, start put, putting some production material in. I've still got my treatment sitting on a desk uh, for a film pr project. If anybody's interested in, in really breaking through and coming up with a new genre of science fiction, just give me a call. Uh, the, um, the, most of what you see on the website really represents probably just only about one-tenth of everything that I have. I couldn't give everything away because I just didn't have the manpower to do it. But a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of this data is soon going to be put into a public work in which everybody can review it and kind of get some sort of a common sense perspective going on, on what's going on with the planet and also the beings that may be interacting with us. Are, are we in safe hands, do you think, John Rhodes? Um, I would say that you're, the hands that you're safest in are the hands that are in action. Uh, we can't rely on governments to do anything. They've proven with, like, Katrina and such, that even if a disaster happens, we're not to rely on them. Yeah. Probably our own hands, too. Right? Probably our own hands, you know. And I would really say that if, if I were getting ready, I would follow the leader. And it, it appears as if the whispering through, you know, the channels that I have open in, into the intelligence networks say that the government's, uh, preparing some old underground bases that they had abandoned at what time, and they're starting to take up refuge in them again. So there's a major push right now to go underground. All right, when we come back, we'll take phone calls with the crypto hunter, John Rhodes. So get ready to let your fingers do the dialing. And we're with John Rhodes, incredible reptilian humanoid theory. So this hour, we shall take your phone calls on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you, John Rhodes, and your phone calls. John, uh, give us one or two more reptilian stories before we go to calls, some of your favorites. Um, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Josh Hone that I had a chance to meet, and uh, he had a very riveting encounter one evening, which he heard something down in his basement. He thought his cat was got stuck or something in one of the cardboard boxes. And um, he walked down into his basement, and as he got to the bottom of the basement, he, 
he found the cat, and the cat was behind a box, but the cat was really, you know, trying, and it, it was acting weird, and it was difficult for him to get it. And I know his wife had sent him down to get the darn cat because the cat was making noise. But when he got down there, he sensed that something was actually in the basement with him. And when he turned around, he could see something that it looked like it was a, some sort of reflection of the light that was across the, on, on the other side of the room behind him. And it was, but it was suspended in the air. And then it was that at that point, um, this being pulled forward into a small pool of light, and he could see that it was actually a very large, broad-shouldered reptilian humanoid being um, that uh, had some sort of a, uh, it wasn't naked, but he had some sort of a chest, almost like a, not football gear, but something that would be akin to some sort of a breastplate, and he also had a utility belt, and um, uh, Josh had said that when he was at the base of the stairs, he doesn't remember anything that happened, but he did find himself um, actually laying on the floor inside the basement when his wife had come down to him. And um, it wasn't until the next day that after things started dawning on him what had actually occurred. He was actually in denial of the whole incident until the next day. But it was something that was revelatory to him, and he was afraid for years to ever let the story out because of being a doctor and everything like that. He was afraid it would destroy his credibility in the small community. Um, the cat the cat was fine. I think it was just coincidence or the reptilian humanoid was in his basement or he was there for Josh in the middle of the night it was probably part of an ongoing series of, of abductions that he had had. Um, right. and, and in a case like this, it was just one of those other things where they the people just wish they had not had, had an encounter at all because they didn't appreciate talking about it. It was just too difficult to adjust in their life. Something's going on out there, John. Something is happening. Something's definitely big... happening. Let's go to the phones east of the Rockies, uh, my neck of the woods here in St. Louis. LaShawn, you're up with us. Hi there. Hi, how are you? We're great. Thanks. Hi. Hi, John. Okay, uh, John, um, you know, I've been listening to the show, and, oh, my God, you make it sound like there are these cute little cuddly little things, <laughs> and they're not. No, they're not. Well, they're not at all. And, you know, I talked about this before. I had my own personal experience mm -hmm. with a reptilian, and it was not good, okay? And uh, I, I felt something in my room. And when I opened my eyes, there's this man with his hands around my throat, okay? He had very long, long blonde hair. He was strong like steel. And I'm pulling and pulling and pulling, trying to physically get him up off of me. So at that point, I got tired, and he was levitating over me. A lot of, the, a lot of the reptilians are very, they are very advanced mentally, uh, spiritually. They're telepathic. They can levitate. They're very powerful, mm -hmm. not just physically, but mentally mm -hmm. and uh, spiritually. They're very powerful. And what I, you know, I, I, George, I told you about this before. You know, if you call for that yeah. assistance, you will get that assistance. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I just said, you know, I just used the word spirit, you know, to my, we all have that higher consciousness within our own being. And you mentioned that before, John, it is there. And if you call to it, you will get that assistance. I didn't know what else to do. And I said, spirit, what do I have to do? And something said, let go and open your mouth. When I physically, I opened my mouth and this loud, loud, like a lion's roar came from inside of me. And at that point, the reptilian lost his grip. He lost his grip, and I saw him hit the ceiling. He hit my ceiling. Mm -hmm. And my mom is in the next room sleeping, and I'm thinking she's going to get up any minute <laughs> to see what's happening, and she never did. Mm -hmm. So he hit the ceiling, and then at that point, I heard all of these animal noises and sounds behind me, and then I began myself levitating off of the bed, which at this point I felt like that was God guiding me, leading me. And and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, my mother's house, her house is just going to be destroyed because it, 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 we, we're, we're getting ready to do battle here. Mm -hmm. And as I got ready to turn around and face him, I just, my eyes popped open. I, it's like I was like, 
asleep but not asleep. Mm-hmm. So after I got up, I called a friend of mine and I told him about it. Later that year, we went down to Edenton, Georgia, to a meeting with this guy who claims to have fought alongside reptilians. Jeez. He described the physical appearance. Okay. Did you did you believe him, LaShawn? Yes, I did. Okay. Yes, George. Yes, I did. He, uh, I, I don't have any proof of this, but it's something, you know, that inner knowing that we have, that gut feeling, and sometimes things, they feel right, and sometimes it doesn't. And, um, you know, I had read his information before, and he claims to have fought alongside of them. He has all this information about their planet and and their planet was destroyed, and they went to this other planet, and then they came to this planet. You're saying, you're saying he fought alongside them. Was he, obviously, he was on their side in some sort of conflict. So some it shows type of that, conflict, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it shows that actually some, some other reptilian humanoids were in agreement with him and were good, good for him to be around, I guess. Like right? you've been saying, I guess, John. Huh? Right, well, you know, it's just, it's interesting, Sean, like you said, said that, you had seen a, a, a man with long blonde hair strangling you at first, and then did he change into a reptilian humanoid? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, I just saw his human physical appearance. Right. At the time, first, okay. I kind of had a feeling that that's what it was, but when I went, when we took this trip to Edenton, Georgia, the guy started talking about it, and he started giving, he started talking about their physical, like when they, I guess when they can transform into their physical appearance. And he, when he described it, and I said to my friend, I said, Leon, are you listening to this? Do you hear this? He said, oh, yes. <laughs> he said, yes, I do. Well, let me ask you this, John, because this is a great oh. story. Are, are they shapeshifters, John Rhodes? Um, some of them can be. I've, um, I, I've encountered a person before that had their girlfriend had said that they had seen the boyfriend shapeshifting, and he had been a reptilian human in contact. And... Um, I came, kind of came in with a grain of salt, thinking that not, you know, of course, I, you know, I'm I'm rather cynical in the UFO community uh, because I I've had so many I've had to filter through so many falsified reports and 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 forgeries. But um, when I encountered this man, uh, or I should say, young man, um, he was telling me that sometimes he feels something move in his in his face, and actually, uh, at that time, I had seen something. Now, <laughs> I'm not a doctor. But I could see something underneath the skin of his face, about maybe a quarter inch long, move underneath the skin of his cheek, across the bridge of his nose, and under towards the other side of his eye while I was looking at him. And he kept saying that he feels snakes inside him. And now I don't know if this was some sort of a nanotechnology that somebody put in him to, and that was moving around. I don't know if it was some sort of... Um, connection with the reptilian part of his b- brain, because, you know, we, all of our face muscles are controlled by the reptilian complex in your ancient brain. So when you're operating from that area where you're really tr- just on the verge between uh, subconscious thinking and awakened state in your own home environment when you're walking around, I think that sometimes um, the face muscles will start co- acting and contracting by themselves without even the n- knowing a movement, the the, particip- the person who's doing it doesn't even know they're doing it, and they're seen actually having this happen to them. But at the other times, I really believe that we're just like angels. Have, there's so many stories we've seen on television in search of with Leonard Nimoy and stuff where they talk about people encountering angels that entertained them in their homes and fed them for Thanksgiving, and they'd go back there the next day and nobody was ever even there. If we have angels that can come down here in human form, and, and fool us to that extent, I believe that there are other beings as well. So you have the eagle man with the angels, and then you have the serpent man, the snake, having the same type of interactions with human beings at times as well. Um, and they're not always good. You know, and she says that I try and make them sound, or I'm making them sound cute and cuddly, but, you know, that on the contrary, I was the first one ever to make any kind of statements as to the how terrible it is that the reptilian humanoids have been to humans throughout the years, Ask certain ones of them and how they can be the tricksters and they can be devilish. They can be everything that you don't ever want to encounter. But at the same time, there are 
the majority of the others that we have to pay attention to that do not come across that way. They're underspoken reports because of the, the, the prevalence of, of modern ufology to throw into this fear angle and to let some of the rather ridiculous kind of take over mainstream ufology. Years ago, there's a lot of con things that we're talking about now that back then they would have fought for the dignity of ufology not to even include it in the discussion, but it's a different world now, you know. We're entertained by a lot of these uh, these subjects. Next up, we go to Joy in Eloy, Arizona. Hey, Joe, go ahead. Hello. Yeah, thank you for taking my call. I have a quick story about uh, uh, reptilians, and I'd like to hear uh, John's uh, uh, comments on it. Mm -hmm. uh, real quickly, I, I had a fellow working for me uh, about 10 years ago, and it, he was an e engineering type, and he, knew, he didn't... Uh, spin yarns, he always uh, spoke in figures and facts. And he had a friend that was the uh, same type of personality, and his friend was dating this lady in Italy. So he was over in Italy with his friend, and his lady friend uh, was uh, a member, a distant uh, relative of the Rothschild family. And so uh, the, the uh, people in Italy were asking her to get a hold of the Rothschild and go see if she can get some funds to help the Holocaust victims there in Italy. And so she arranged for the meeting with uh, Lord Rothschild up in England. Mm. So she went up there, and she was meeting with him. And while they were meeting, uh, Lord Rothschild was called out of the room. And so he left, and uh, she could hear voices in the other room, the next room. And there was a... Uh, a little door that opened up, a demo-waiter door, you know, between the two rooms. And she peeked through this door, and there was uh, Lord Rothschild taking instructions from a reptilian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to get John's comment on that. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, again, I've, I've heard a lot of stories. Uh, we've all heard a lot of stories. It's very difficult at times to delineate which ones are true and which ones aren't. However, I can tell you through my experiences investigating it over the years that there's been very, very few cases in which a contact would happen in which there was anybody with an earshot or eye shot that was not intentionally supposed to know that they were there. Um, we're talking about beings that, um, who will, for example, appear in a child's room because they know that's the safest room to appear in, in the closet of a child's room because they know that if a child reported somebody coming out of their closet, their parents would just brush them off. Um, and also, you know, if you come out of a, a, an area that's not seen very well, you have the opportunity to know who you might be walking up against. You know, you can't just materialize in somebody's home. They, you, they, they might be having a Christmas party or something like that <laughs> before you get down right in the middle of the living room. So, um uh, when you hear of stories where it's especially connected with some sort of a leader um, being in a presence of a reptilian humanoid where somebody has seen it and they've gone away to report it, I tend to think that those stories like that are, are, are highly fictionalized. I'm not saying they're entirely untrue because there could be elements to it that I'm not familiar with that could lend credibility to the report. However, it seems... <clears throat> that it's like everybody saying, I believe in reincarnation, but er not everybody could have been Cleopatra. So <clears throat> at some point, you've got to say to yourself, how much of this is influenced just by um, conversation out there amongst people that um, make things up just so they can propel their uh, ideological belief and project them onto other beings, like anthropomorphizing our, our subconscious demons, the reptilians of our id, by projecting them everywhere. Um, we do know that these guys have got, uh, you know, heredity that has lineages that go back some, and they seem to be related. I, I truly believe that there's a linear um, uh, hierarchy going on on this planet, but it, I don't necessarily believe that everybody we run into, all the leaders are reptilian humanoids. You know, it's just, I just failed to see that happening. I think it's just easier for us, like I've said before, to be able to project the evils of mankind on some sort of an image that we've already been told is demonic and just l let that go. You know, it's sad to recognize that we've allowed these guys to, to have such dominion over the planet. And, and it's a reflection of what humans are all about. We are the killer ape. You don't need the killer reptilian. 
We have the killer rape inside us that has demonstrated, demonstrated time after time after time that it can be truly, truly violent. Do you think that Mothman, the people who saw Mothman, might have been seeing, seen some kind of reptilian? Uh, yeah, I do believe that, um, uh, particularly a Draco. Um, the glowing red eyes are, are also synonymous with, with reptilian humanoids. The fact that it was flying and seen overhead, and at some points it shows that they thought the eyes were down towards its chest. Well, if you're flying overhead and you've got your head drooped down low, it may look like the look, glow from the eyes is actually in the chest region, where it might actually be the head drooped down low. But, um, yeah, before some sort of a, a, a mass traumatic event like the, the, the collapse of Silver Bridge there, um, for that kind of event to take place, um, you know, when people die, even in a local environment like in a house or something, a portal opens up. And the portal, when, when people enter that portal through some sort of a traumatic event, there's some sort of a psychological shock that people go through, like the, the pumping adrenaline of their terror as they see their last seconds of their eyes, life flash through by their eyes before they die, somehow gets impregnated into the ether at that point in time and, and puts a ripple in time space and that when, when the people die like that this portal that takes you over to the other physical universe which we think of it as death but it's just a, a vibrational difference in, in location um, uh, when that opens like that you can go both ways you know the angels or the guides have come been seen as balls of light to come pe take people out of car wrecks but then at the same time, if you can come this direction and you can take beings back with you, if, there's, with that, if that portal doesn't seal itself, there's a high potential for something else slipping through there until it does close and start having interactions with humans on this side. So, I, I, rem I remember when I first started doing Coast to Coast, mm -hmm. and uh, my, I had an interview with a woman by the name of Pamela Stonebrook. Do you right. know her? Right, she, yes, uh, Pamela. She claims that she had a three-year affair with a reptilian. And it was, for me, John, the most bizarre interview <laughs> I had ever done, at least at that point. <laughs> um, yes, it didn't make us human men feel very wanted either. Um, uh, you know, phys physically, I think, I think if there's any relationships going on, they're mostly of a mental uh, relationship and a, and a spiritual relationship. Uh, the physical communions, I guess it could happen, maybe. I mean... Like I've said before, there are humans that, you know, entertain themselves with animals as distasteful as it is. So the idea of one species crossing over to another species like that, you know, I guess it could happen. But at the same time, you know, I, I've also known that um, that there's a lot of women that tend to have uh, encounters like this that end up being, how do I say this, that end up being uh, drawn into the, the control issues of their sexual it's life. Like, it's, it's like a cult. Well, no, yeah, what, these people, especially with women, they tend to get into things like S&M and things like that because during their experiences, you know, that they perceived as being a sexual experience, there was this issue of control going on. So yeah, that truly, becomes an issue with them for that point onwards. Truly bizarre. We'll be truly back with bizarre. more phone calls with John Rhodes on Coast to Coast AM. Well, next hour, it'll be full moon open lines with police officers invited to call in with some of their bizarre full moon stories. I know they're out there. When we come right back, it'll be final phone calls with the crypto hunter John Rhodes on Coast to Coast AM. We're with John Rhodes. John, why would we see reptilian sketches, artistical sketches of these reptilians? Do they always seem to be muscular and good shape? How come we don't have any, you know, out of shape reptilians? <laughs> <laughs> have you noticed like that? Yeah, it's kind of like the advertisement for V, where the, the reporter turns to her and goes, aren't there any, you know, unattractive reptoids or reptilians or Vs? <laughs> you know, because it seems like the entire crew, crew is really handsome. Um, uh, I think it's just the nature of a reptile and the way that its metabolism deals with proteins and foods that they tend to be very muscular and lean. Uh, there's probably more mammals that have additional fat on them. Uh, for storage of res and reserves of, of energy rather than a reptile. Um, and also um, uh, the fact that, you know, these these guys are probably have been, uh, how many years have they been actually, you know, uh, um, working on a diet that's actually may be metabolizing more energy in a, in a better form of it than we do. 
look, it's not until recently we've come up with all this stuff to fatten us up and everything. <laughs> you know, all these, all this, ah. you know, garbage we take, we try and, you know, fill in the gaps with something good, but you know how it is. It's always Look. nice to splurge. Back to the phone, Salt Lake City, Utah, we go west of the Rockies. It is Molly's turn. Hi, Molly. Hi. Hi. I have two quick questions, if I'm allowed the time. You First are of allowed. All, I was wondering if, John, all of these different species, is there a supreme being above them all, a, a god figure who created all of them, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, yes. I believe that the, the, the god that created us cre- created them. Okay. You know, I think it's really interesting from a, a Christian theological point of view that um, we should think that we're the only children. You know, there's, it's, you. A large, it's a large house. And there's a lot of brothers and sisters. Uh, second quick, quick question is, I know that when I was five, I was abducted. Mm-hmm. When I was born on my um, birth certificate, I had O positive blood. I now have A negative blood. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could have been a mistake, I keep thinking. I always have that thought, though. So. I'm wondering if there is any genetic, um, if there are any genetic uh markers that say we may have intermingled sexually with them or... or right, okay. Um, um, first of all, you, the, the fact that your blood can change blood type. You know, there are human chimeras where the actual, in the embryo, the two embryos will actually merge to become one and share mm-hmm. blood types. Rare, but it happens. Very, very rare, but it does happen. Um, there have been people that have, you know, tested Rh negative blood and go to Rh positive blood back and forth. Um, there, um, we have tracked the higher incident and located a higher incidence of people who have had reptilian, humanoid, and other phenomenon happen to them that are Rh negative, which is a marker on the sur- surface of the gene. It's actually a protein, and um, that it has a higher dominance in the, the races of from Scandinavia, Ireland, Scotland and also back into the Caucasus Mountains and, and into the regions where the Basques are in the Pyrenees Mountains. Mm-hmm. And that um, uh, this RH negative group uh, appears to have been perhaps some of the earlier, earlier uh, linear, linear uh, experimentation groups that have been going down through multi-matrinal um, uh, or mother and daughter uh, lineages. And um, just as we perhaps may have crossbred with our, uh, with Neanderthals. There may have been groups that a long time ago were taken off the surface of the earth and put underground. There were mutations that happened to everybody else. And then all of a sudden, the other group comes back up to the surface, but they've got red hair. They tend to be of st- tall stature. And evidence of archaeological evidence across the planet show that these people have gone as far as China, have, may have gone also out down to the areas of where the Maya capitals were in Central America many, many thousands of years ago. So, yeah, there is um, something going on where they have had um, a hybridization program that's taken place, not entirely fusing together us so that we have scales, but on very, very minute levels where information, the same information that maybe carries dreams and other things that you may have been passed on through your genetic library from your ancestors, that type of, um, of information exchange on a genetic level um, that perhaps affects the way the brain works or the way that the, one pursues, pursues spirituality. But yeah, there are specific groups of people that have had interactions. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much for calling. It was a great question. Let's go to Rob, truck driving in North Dakota. You're up with us. Rob, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Sure thing, loud and clear. No snow out your way, is there? Uh, not yet, not yet. No. Hey, Rob, where are you up in North Dakota? I'm actually in Fargo, heading back to Minot. Yeah, right. I was born in Minot. Oh, okay. Yeah, right um, on. I got a a little, you know, kind of insight for you. Okay. I was a uh, state director for a UFO organization um, for three years from 94 to 96. I'm actually kind of nervous. I wasn't going to call in or, you know, say where I'm from or anything, but uh, I got a tape sent to me 
mm-hmm. with uh, you know flying objects on it, and I have some friends in the newscast business, and <clears throat> they went and analyzed it, you know, made sure it was the real thing, and this was on a videotape. It wasn't like DVDs or anything, and uh, so they, you know, it was a triangle object, three lights, and then there's like you know in those plasma balls that you touch and you can see the electricity. Mm-hmm. Well, you, that's what we saw, and uh, and I'll back up just a little bit prior prior to that. Um, like if the police department or sheriff's department, you know, if they got any phone calls, they would call me. I would go out and do the investigation. Well, in uh, Beach, North Dakota, there was a case, and OSI, my father's retired Air Force, so I was in my 20s and, you know, in the mid-90s. Mm-hmm. I'm 37 now, and my father, he's retired Air Force, and uh, so I know a lot of people from the Minot Air Force Base up there. And OSI, Office of Special Investigations, which I know I'm going to get a lot of crap now, you know, saying this on air. But uh, they worked with me on a, on the Beach, North Dakota case. I gave them some information. They gave me some information. Mm-hmm. And But on this tape that was sent, two guys came to my house. One guy had a suit on. wasn't like a black suit. <clears throat> or anything like that. It was just, you know, dark colored suit, blue or navy blue or something. And then the other guy was wearing jeans, you know, just a jean jacket and jeans. Mm-hmm. And they wanted this tape from me. So uh, I gave it to him, you know. And then one of the guys called my house, which I didn't know they had my phone number. They called me, and they were just asking me weird questions like, do you live by yourself? You know, do you fear for your life? Blah, blah, blah. Kind of like scare tactic type. Mm-hmm. Type question. So after that, I resigned um, from investigating, you know, UFOs or anything like that. I was like, this isn't worth my, <laughs> you know, this isn't worth my life. So <laughs> right. quite a while, I've, I've, you know, been wanting to tell people that story. Only a few people know about it. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing. You know, that that's the whole thing. You know, um, uh, I have an associate of mine named Tal that um, had had done work back in the you know the uh, aerospace industries and and the stories that they have coming out of the even the the private corporate groups which are a reflection of what the military industrial complex is doing with these black operations when these guys mean business they they absolutely mean business and and there's no mistake about it i mean there's no misinterpretations at all and um uh, when it comes to being intimidated, it's just a matter of knowing that, you know, if they've got you, they've got you. And, you know, the thing is, is that it, a lot of this, you have to finally come out and start saying something a, a, about it. You have to, everybody has to step forward at some point in time in order to get it off your chest, because otherwise it's going to eat you up even more if you don't ever say anything at all. That's a good point. Next up, we go to West Hills, California. Kurt? You're up with us on Coast to Coast. Hey, Kurt, go ahead. George, appreciate the opportunity to inquire. Uh, this is not the reason for the call, but it's amazing. I was born in Frankfurt, Germany. My father was on base with Elvis Presley. Wow. I was born O positive. I am now A negative, according to the Red Cross, when I donate blood. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, my whole point was this. Uh, I I have been visited since 64, 35 years later. My sister confirmed from seeing out the door that I have been visited. My concern is I don't care if they take my body. I'm the driver. The body is just the car. Mm -hmm. But if they take my soul, that scares the heck out of me. Mm That's an, that's an allegiance of spirit. I mean, they're 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 not fighting us over us as far as um, our our physical resources. This is far far beyond that. If you're just think if anybody's thinking out there that somebody's fighting over just territorial possessions or physical possessions, they're completely missing the mark. What's really going on now is that there is going to be, as people have historically recalled, a war in heaven, and this is talking about the it's talking about allegiance of your your frequency or your soul, 
no matter how many times you come back here to reincarnate, they're both struggling over it, left and right, like like two polar opposites. And really I'm struggling it, now. Yeah, well, you know, it's, the whole thing about this is that we we don't need any one of these groups. Look, if the, if anybody wants to fight over us, that's their game. But you know what? We're more powerful than we are, and we don't need. I, we need everybody needs each other. And if and if anybody's fighting over your souls, then that's their battle. But that doesn't. We don't have to participate in it. It's a matter of staying as neutral as you can, because if you maintain a neutrality upon yourself and your soul then you're in a point of balance and you're able to determine, make determinations for yourself. If you get too emotionally drawn into one argument over another, they've got you. And they've done it to us before, time and time and time again. And, and the only way to stop this bad cycle is to break free of it, which means maintain your independence at all cost. What do you think these underground caverns look like, John? Well, um... I know I've seen photographs of some of the cavern systems down in Mexico that it looks like one huge chamber, like football stadium size after another, linked together by passages, and um, they're quite expansive. Um, we've seen Crystal Cave most recently come up with those huge nine-foot crystals underground. Have you seen that photograph, George? Yes. Absolutely remarkable, you know. Um, I know some of the military industrial complex have deep underground bases that extend more than eight to twelve thousand feet underground and and they're they're like small cities and men in the black projects have have met women in black projects and together they've had children and the, there's an underworld already in existence beneath our feet it's part of the shadow government there's a shadow government there's also a shadow society in existence and it's just too bad that we're left up here on the surface to fend for ourselves and never given the real truth as to what might be happening. Otherwise, you know what? I think we'd all be digging holes in our backyard, and we'd be story food, we'd be finding water resources, and we'd be getting ready in case something happened to where the grid shut down for even two or three months. Well, and it could shut down, John. Absolutely. We get hit with, we get hit with the next flare. Look out. We're but, history. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, um, uh, it it sounds so bizarre, but, you know, for like $85, $75, it's some major outlet here that you can get uh, 270 meals that last 10, 20 years for like $85. You know, it's easy to put that much away just to know that you have something. But if you have nothing and you've been told ahead of time, then you have nobody to blame when an event happens. Good. You know, all, all these started. companies now are trying to go um, paperless, so you right. pay everything online. You get your statements online. Everything right. gets sent to your email. What happens when the grid goes down and you can't go online anymore? You can't do any of that for a while. I mean, everything's going to get clogged. Everything will go. And you know what? It has to, you have to be reduced down and you have to refocus your priorities in life. And, and it's not going to be all those electronics, gadgets, and everything like that. When this thing starts happening, I would suggest people just don't watch the news. You know what? I'd rather watch the comedy channel than hear any news because the news is made to stress you out. And uh, you know what? And if you can't help anything that's going on outside your local level, just start reducing your vision down to your local level and to your family. And Let's then, go to – go ahead. And then, and then just kind of like, you know, know whatever happens outside your range of vision is going to happen regardless of what you think or know about it. I'll try to squeeze in a few more calls for you. Louisiana. Hey, Cornelius. Go ahead, Cornelius. Hey, George and John. God Hi. bless both of you all. I just want to say you got the best call screeners, Gina and Tommy. And um, I want to say if the Saints go undefeated, you know the end of the world is coming. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all, gentlemen. God bless you. Y'all have a nice night. That's it, huh? Yeah. All right. You're, you're welcome. Must be Tommy's brother or something. Tommy <laughs> that's also. right. Got to be. St. Louis, we go. Hello, Rebecca, first-time caller. Go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you, gentlemen, this evening. Hi, Rebecca. <laughs> Um, I'm a little nervous because it's my first time really publicly discussing some of this. And um, when I tend to open up about it, things pop up for me. So, uh, I mean, I've had, a, I've had a lot of experience starting with those little dreaming about, like, flying over my, my hometown and dreams of underground cities and a lot of experiences throughout the years. But my most intense uh, were brought up with tonight's topic with the reptilians. And I happened to live in Las Vegas for a couple of years with um, a guy, I suppose, that I, I consider to be a reptilian. And it was very intense for me. 
hmm. because it was a power struggle. And and he, I mean, he came across as very charming, tall, thin, kind of a little bug-eyed, but very charming. And he said a couple things that were alarming, that he knew me long before we ever met, um, and I kind of dismissed it. And then he got a tattoo of, uh, of a painting. It was Fall of the Rebel Angels. But he wasn't, you know, satanic or he didn't seem that dark. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I had a couple of experiences in Vegas which were very intense for me and where the people, I suppose, that I, that I ran into even admitted to not being human. And um, one was... Uh, was it like it a seemed, vampire cult, Rebecca? Well, one one situation may have been cult involved. I, I mean, I went to a, uh, a house, and this girl offered to give me a tarot reading, and then it got really fuzzy after that. And I had a lot of missing time, and um, the, the only part I really remember is the third day and trying to get home. And I was driving with this girl, and then it seemed like it was no longer her. Her skin started to turn like kind of, it looked like it had a bluish glow to it, yeah, and her she, pupils she, were changing. She shifted. I want you to, I'm going to put oh, you on hold, Rebecca. We're going to put you on hold. John, we're out of time, my friend, but I want to thank you. Good luck in everything you hey, do. Thank you very much. I invite everybody to drop in at my website at reptoids.com. Make sure also you go over to it. I have it there at the bottom of the page, a link to um, ABC TV. So you guys who ever want to talk about these reptilian guys, Meet up and talk. Let them know what you think. All you got to do is hold up your fingers in the shape of a V. I'll be back in a moment with open lines, full moon open lines. And Rebecca, you stay. I want you to finish your story. We've got full moon open lines for you now. So we will be going to St. Louis, Colorado, Chicago, Bakersfield, California, Cleveland, Ohio as well, and all over the place in just a moment on Coast to Coast Day. Yeah. And let's go back to Rebecca in St. Louis. She was telling us the story of the shape-shifting boyfriend, perhaps. Hey, Rebecca, still with us? <laughs> what you, would you think of all this rain in St. Louis? Oh, uh, well, right now it's nice and dry, so that's that's helpful. <laughs> Finally, one day, right? I know. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I suppose what I was saying was I was actually away from the boyfriend at the time who I thought, well, I think is reptilian. And I was with a girl, and she was the one that started to turn blue, and her pupils looked like ink blotches. And I was trying to get home. And there was, I mean, she was pointing to the sky and talking about home, and, and you know, it was kind of fuzzy, and I was just trying to get back to my home. And the boyfriend was standing at the top of the stairs just watching this whole thing unfold as I was trying to get back. And I get inside my apartment after being gone for three days, and he just sits on the floor across from me. And when he stands up, I see a, like a, a snake where he was sitting. Jeez. And I was like, okay, well, I've, I've had a very rough few days, which I have missing time from. And, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, I, it, the energy is very thick and dark and heavy, and I'm just trying to, I feel like, keep, keep my sanity in the situation and, and, and make sure that I'm okay. And so I, I wasn't ready to leave him at that point, but in, in Vegas, it just seemed like it's this, like, magnification for a lot of really strange things. And I met a mother and daughter who I had at my home, and the little girl was telling me about different entities watching us and brought up the situation with that the girl, the shape-shifting girl, and I got a little nervous, brought her inside, and I talked privately with her and her mother, and their eyes were moving back and forth really quickly. And they were trying to say that I was like them. And I was really confused by this. And they said, don't tell him, which, which was the reptilian boyfriend, so like he won't understand he's not like us. He'll leave you. Wow. And so after all these experiences, I started – I tried working with this gentleman I found on, online who had said that he worked with abductees and. What was his he, first name? Can you? Can you tell his us? name was Don. The first name was Don. I think he was in Indiana. Okay. Older gentleman. I didn't know a whole lot about him, and 
he gave me these long questionnaires to fill out, and he had said something about us being in satellite circles and how, we, you know, we were sometimes, like, we tended to be targeted. Did he help you? Um, well, he, he was helping me. Like, he felt that I was... 